the moment I signed the sales contract for the old farmhouse, I was happier than I had been in years. You see, in life, I did everything right. I heeded the advice of my teachers and parents. After finishing school, I went on to university and obtained my degree in business. Graduating with honors, I started working at a fancy company. And after a decade and a half, I climbed high enough on the corporate ladder to become the head of the sales department. It meant a substantial salary, but also more responsibility and longer hours on the job. During these years, I moved into newer, fancier places every couple of years, bought more luxuries, but spent less and less time at home enjoying it all. With each passing year, I grew to hate my life a little bit more. I despised my job, my apartment, and even the overcrowded city I lived in. I yearned for a break, some quiet and solitude. When my Uncle Dennis died, I was surprised to be named the sole benefactor, as apparently he had no other relatives but me. Selling most of his property left me with a substantial sum, and with the savings I already had, I decided it was time for a change. I had long toyed with the idea of moving to a rural area, growing my own vegetables, getting a few chickens, and living a self-sustaining lifestyle far away from the big city. It had always been a fantasy, but reality was different. There were always deadlines to meet, projects to finish, and contracts to discuss. As time moved along, year after year, I did nothing. Now though, enough was enough. I didn't want to end up like those who finally made it to retirement to realize they were too old and feeble to follow their dreams. When I quit my job, my boss was surprised and flabbergasted. Of course, I still had my termination period of four weeks, but most of that time was spent making adjustments while my boss was busy finding a replacement for me. I started looking around for promising property, and after a week of searching, I found it an old farmhouse with quite a few plots around it, located in a small village near a mountainous area. Until years ago, it had been owned by a woman. But after her death, her son had put it up for sale. Upon visiting the place, I saw that it was old and a bit run down. But I was sure all of this could be fixed. My last day of work arrived quickly. And a few weeks later, I finally signed the sales contract and began moving the few belongings I wanted to keep to the old farmhouse. Once I had put together some sort of temporary living quarters, I decided it was time to move in. I attempted to remodel the old house myself, but I was soon reminded that I never had any talent using my hands. In the end, I gave up in frustration and contracted a company for the job. It took another couple of weeks, but once they were done, the place looked nice, cozy, and modern. After the repairs on the chicken coop were finished, I bought half a dozen chickens and a rooster. By now, I decided it was time to visit my few neighbors. To the north of me, quite a bit away, lived an older lady. Next to her, a middle-aged couple whose kids went to middle school. After my initial introductions, I didn't have much to do with them. To the south lived an older couple, the Rectors. They resided in a huge old farmhouse and used to be farmers themselves when they were younger, but had since retired. They were nice and assured me they'd help out if I ever had any problems. And then, there was only one person left, the old man living in the farm to the east of me. He was in his late fifties or early sixties, owning the fields adjacent to mine. Only a small dirt road divided our properties, and I had seen him from afar a few times. Whenever I greeted him, he'd ignore me. His face was hard, as if carved from stone, 
his lips always pressed together, and he had a perpetually angry expression. The moment I tried walking towards his farm, he did his best to ignore me. When he saw that I walked right towards him, he turned to me. His face showed that he'd rather do anything else but talk to me. Hey there, I'm Daniel. Lang, I bought the place. I know damn well who you are. You're the guy who bought Elizabeth's old house and made it all fancy and whatnot. Yeah, it's nice to meet you, I said, extending my hand for a greeting. He didn't budge or even look at the hand I was awkwardly holding out in the empty air between us. Why'd you move here? He asked. I was going to try my luck at farming. I always wanted to grow my own, I replied, breaking the silence. The old man burst into laughter. You? Farming? Well, your hands are as soft as a girl's. This land is tough. I'll tell you right away that you won't grow a damn thing here. We don't need no city folks like that out here. He spat on the ground in front of me. Without another word, he made his way towards his shack. For a while, I stood there, looking after the old man. I was nothing short of surprised and dumbfounded. Why had he thrown so much hate at me? What the hell was his problem? More than a bit mad, I went back home. What had I done to get this type of reaction? In the end, I told myself that he was most likely a miserable old fool who hated himself and people in general. Not my problem. From that point onward, I tried my best to get the farm going. My knowledge was limited though. The internet, with its endless information, is fantastic. But it was all secondhand knowledge. I soon realized that if I ever wanted to learn how to do anything, I'd have to get my own hands dirty. I started with the old lady's small garden and planted a variety of different vegetables. The month after, I got the old greenhouse running again. Soon, I had to learn that real life was no harvest moon. Running a farm and growing vegetables was tough work. Needless to say, things didn't grow well at all. It was at a later meeting with Hans Rector and his wife that I learned that the ground here wasn't the best. They didn't know what it was, but almost everyone had trouble getting things to grow. You needed a lot of care and fertilizer if you wanted to succeed. A decade ago, a few small-time farmers were still living here, and as things got harder, most of them abandoned the trade. Some turned to raising livestock, others changed professions. There was only one single person whose fields were still flourishing. Old Wurz? Turned out that the old man was no other than my next door neighbor. When I told the rectors how my introduction went with him, they both started to laugh. Wurz was a bitter old man. He didn't like people and had lived alone most of his life. He was a very solitary man. And when I asked if something happened to him, they both said no. It was just how he was. I'd be best to ignore him. That's what everybody else did. As I said, I took things slow, worked the garden, studied different types of seeds, and how to take care of crops, and many other farming topics. It was early summer by then, too late to actually grow anything in the fields. So I let them lay fallow for the year. As summer moved along, though, I was surprised to see how worse fields were bursting with ripe grain and vegetables. I mean, sure, they told me the old man was doing all right, but what I saw was more than that. No, he seemed to be doing pretty damn well. I could barely get a couple of tomato plants to bear fruit in the greenhouse, and yet he had fields of them. Harvest came and went. I was frustrated at my own inability to grow anything, but also impressed at how well he was doing. I didn't like it one bit. As summer turned to autumn, there was one thing I found a bit strange. 
I often caught the old guy driving out into the middle of the night and returning a few hours later. I noticed it by accident one night when I decided to take a walk in the mild autumn air and gaze at the stars. On my way to the local viewing platform, a car approached me from behind with its headlights off, speeding past, yet I was sure I had seen old Werner. I didn't think much of it. Assuming he might have forgotten his headlights, the article was about a middle-aged woman still missing since last autumn, a mother of two who had gone on a hiking trip in the nearby area. As I started reading, Susan Rector, Hans's wife, came over. Such a sad story. I wonder why it keeps happening. Wait, hold on. What do you mean? I asked. Oh, it's those hiking paths near the mountains. Each year, people vanish there. The authorities say it's slippery slopes, and people aren't careful enough. I wonder why they don't close it off, Susan added. Ah, really is something, her husband said. They always warn hikers and climbers, but people won't listen. A mother of two. God, what was she even thinking? As I listened to them, I learned that more than a dozen people had gone missing near the mountain range last year. It hadn't only been the woman, but an older man as well. They said it was almost inevitable that people went missing there. Of course, people talked to the local council, but they didn't listen. The normal hiking paths and climbing locations were safe and secure. And there were enough warnings about straying from the paths. While I listened to them, there was something in the back of my mind, something that I couldn't quite grasp. Only when I returned home and saw old man Werner stalking around his fields did I remember what it was. The woman who had gone missing in autumn, wasn't that the time he went out on all those trips? I realized what my brain was trying to put together. And the more I thought about it, the more everything did fit together. He drove out in the middle of the night, headlights off, to an unknown location and there was this special fertilizer of his. For a moment, I couldn't help but imagine old man Werner out on the hiking paths at night, searching for lonely wanderers to turn them into fertilizer. But what was I thinking? I almost burst out laughing at my own ridiculous idea. This wasn't a movie, this was real life. Somehow though, I couldn't completely get rid of the idea. I don't know why I did it, but I started to spy on the old man. It might have been my frustration. It might have been boredom. It might have been the resentment I felt towards him. I don't know. It was not that I believed in my idea. It was way too far-fetched. I told myself that all I wanted was to figure out how he grew his crops and what sort of fertilizer he used. I knew I was only lying to myself, though. Now, I thought there was more about this old fool. The strange behavior and that fertilizer of his. The more I thought about it, the more I was able to convince myself. You see, whenever I saw him out in the fields applying his fertilizer, my thoughts went back to the same topic. I told myself to just stop and leave it alone, but I just couldn't. It wasn't long before my curiosity turned into an obsession, and I started to keep tabs on him. I took notes on how often he went out, when he got up in the morning, how long he stayed up in the evening, and many other things. It wasn't like I had much else to do. Anyway, most of my fields resembled a barren wasteland after a few weeks. I had this whole routine written down, knowing pretty much everything that went on at his farm. So, I was more than a bit surprised when I saw him drive out with his car in the middle of the night on a Saturday. He hadn't done that in the past five weeks, and it was by sheer coincidence that I'd even noticed it. It was early morning when he returned. I saw him get out of his car, but instead of going back inside, 
He went to the back of the car and opened up the trunk. I sat in the dark of the night, hunched behind my window. I pressed my binoculars against my head so hard it hurt. My whole body tensed up, and I didn't dare move or breathe. In horror, I watched how old Werner dragged something out of the trunk. It was long, big, and covered in a thick blanket. I watched as he heaved it over his shoulder, taking a first step towards his shack. I saw something long and thin dangle from the pack. Oh, Jesus Christ, I thought. Don't tell me. Was that what I thought it was? Had I really seen that? No, 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 no. I must be wrong. I was seeing things. Maybe I'd imagined it. But what I'd seen dangling, it couldn't be. I thought back to the lady in the newspaper article. Was this another one? Another victim? Another ingredient for his fertilizer? I had to go and find out more. I should take a look at the shack. The moment I saw how old man Fernair returned from his shack, all thoughts about going there completely left my mind. It was dark, but in the moonlight, I could clearly see that his hands and lower arms were covered in something. I saw his dark, angry expression as he made his way back to his house. My whole body was filled with fear. For the first time in my entire life, I was honestly and utterly terrified. I couldn't help the urge to hide. As soon as he walked back to his house, I knew there was a reason for it. The old guy couldn't possibly see me. I had the lights off, and I was way too far away for him to notice anything at the windows. Once he vanished inside, I started to calm down, at least a bit. My mind was still a crazed whirlwind of contradicting ideas. One part of it said I was stupid, and nothing was going on. The other part told me that old man Werner was a crazed serial killer. Even in bed, I couldn't calm down, and it took me a long time until I actually fell asleep. When the rooster awoke me in the morning, I was thankful that the few hours of sleep I had were undisturbed and free from dreams about bloody old men. While I was drinking my morning coffee, I was watching his house as I had done every morning for the past few weeks, as if nothing had happened last night. The old man went out to take care of his fields, and this guy really murdered someone last night and dragged the body into his shack. As I sat there, I was almost shaking with curiosity. I had to find out. I knew that every week on Sunday evening, he spent an hour or two at his shack, and during that time, likely mixed up his fertilizer. Once he was done, he went back to his house and most likely straight to bed. This might be the best chance to see what he's up to in there. The whole day, I was antsy and couldn't sit still. I made plans on how I'd approach and how I'd find a bloody body lying on the floor of the shack. When the day finally turned into night, I turned off the lights in my house give him the impression I went to bed early. He'd believe it, I was sure, thinking that Ua City folks don't work as hard as he did in his arrogance. All the while, I sat at my window, watching him with my binoculars. My cue was when the lights of the shack turned off, and the old man went back to his house. I dressed in all black, and after waiting for another half an hour, I made my way outside with low and quiet steps. I approached his place, and for the first time, I wasn't mad at how well his corn had grown. It allowed me to get near his house without having to hide. Once I was closer, I checked out his farmhouse from between the corn. The lights were off, there were no sounds, and nothing was moving. It was clear that the old man must have gone to bed. To be on the safe side, I still waited for another ten minutes. When they passed, I rushed to the shack. My heart was beating heavily when I made it, and everything stayed quiet. I wasn't too surprised to find the door locked by a padlock. Even though I knew there was no way I'd be able to open it, 
I had imagined that I'd be lucky enough to find the door unlocked. Anyways, now I went for the window of the shack that I was able to see from my house. I knew it would be locked too, but it was one of those old wooden windows consisting of two shutters held shut by a metal bolt in the center. I might be able to pry it open wide enough to loosen the bolt and open it. I pried away the two shutters from one another until I could fit my finger in between. At that point, I knew where the bolt was. I'd have to be careful. If I broke the window, the old man would hear me without a doubt. After a nerve-wracking minute of toying around with a couple of tools, I finally loosened the bolt and the window opened. I scanned the window frame and the area below. Once I saw that there was nothing I could topple over, I climbed inside. The shack was a lot larger than I imagined. For now, all I saw were shelves filled with tools and various other things. Step by step, I made my way through the place, scanning it. In the end, I took out a small flashlight I had brought to get a closer look. There was a sort of mixing station at the end of the shack. To be honest, it was nothing but an old workbench. But on it, there was an assortment of things. There were containers of various chemicals and fertilizers, a sack of bone meal, and a few bags of his complete fertilizer mixture. As I looked on, I noticed something next to the workbench, a sort of metal composter, as well as a freezer combined, cramped into the corner. Next to it, the composter was quite modern, probably one of those quick composters I had read about. My skin started to crawl as I stared at it. I took a deep breath, and after toying with it for a bit, I figured out how to open it. The instant it opened, almost vomited. The smell alone was enough to make me wretch. When I looked inside, I saw bloody guts and a few pieces of half-rotten meat. I cursed and stumbled back in shock and disgust, crashing straight into the assortment of containers on the workbench. A number of them clattered to the ground in an ear-shattering noise. My eyes grew wide. You goddamn idiot. What the hell did you just do? I turned off the flashlight and waited, hoping against hope that old man Verner would stay asleep. My prayers weren't answered, and my heart almost stopped when I heard the front door of his house open. God damn it, what's going on out there? If it's you damn kids again. He said nothing else. Oh, did he see the window? I tried to think. I tried to remember if I closed it after me, but I couldn't. For all I knew, the two window shutters might still be wide open. Is there someone out there? I heard his voice, then his footsteps came closer. I dare you, whoever the devil you are, you show yourself. I didn't move, hoping against all certainty that he'd go back to his house, but only a moment later, I heard him from the side of the shack. You've got to be kidding me. He must have seen the open window. I could already hear him rummaging with the padlock. Now or never, I thought. There was no way I could explain this to him. I was back at the window, trying to get up. But before I could do more than put my own foot into the window frame, the door opened. In one swift motion, he hit the light switch saw me standing there, dressed all in black, trying to flee the scene. Now what in the hell are you doing in my shack? Then the smell hit him, and his anger turned to pure rage. You goddamn. But in his rage, he couldn't even finish his sentence anymore. In his blind rage, he picked up the first tool he could find, a rake came swinging after me. There was no way I'd make it out in time. I barely ducked away and fled to the back of the shack. No, don't. I swear, I, I didn't see anything. I only... But 
I didn't get the chance to finish, as I had to dodge another hit of the rake. Finally, he saw the open composter and the disturbance on the workbench. You just had to know, didn't you? You just couldn't let it be. Do you have any idea what I went through to finish this? One day, a decade, one whole goddamn decade. And now you're trying to steal it. What the hell had he just admitted to? What I thought he had, that's it. You're the last person to ever barge in here, and I swear by it. With that, he threw the rake to the ground and came at me himself. He almost jumped me. And only now did I realize that old man Werner might have been an old man. But goddamn was he. A life of farming had made his body stout, hardening his muscles. All I could do was struggle against him, preventing him from overpowering me. I clung to sheer desperation as I was pushed back against the workbench. His eyes were wide open, and a moment later, he raised one of his hands hitting me square in the face twice. When I stumbled, he closed his hands around my neck, and I couldn't breathe. Only at this moment did I realize that he was really going to kill me, that I was going to die. Stars appeared in front of my eyes, but there was nothing I could do. I twitched in his iron-hard grip, grasped blindly around for something, anything. My hands closed around something hard and cold. And with all the power I could muster, I swung it in the direction of old man Verner. There was a nasty sound, and the old man screamed. Only when I swung it a second time did I see what I was holding, an old mallet. For a moment, I saw the surprise in his eyes, and his grip loosened only to close once more, even harder, in his fury. He wasn't just trying to strangle me anymore. No, he was going to break my neck by sheer force. So again and again, I hit him with the mallet. After three more hits, his grip finally loosened, and he slumped down, falling to the ground. As I looked down at his head, I saw a nasty inward bump at the top where I'd hit him. What surprised me the most, though, was all the blood that still kept gushing forward. Time stood still, as if in a trance. I watched the blood flow from his unmoving body. It must have been only seconds before I realized what I had done. But to me, it felt like an eternity. The bloody mallet clattered to the floor and I pushed old Werner's body away from me. I started shaking, almost screaming. I had killed him. I had murdered someone. I had done the right thing, though. I mean, hadn't I? He would have killed me. He had killed others. The guts, the meats, the freezer. There was no doubt, and I did it in self-defense. When I opened the freezer, my world crumbled apart. What I found inside wasn't a corpse, neither were body parts. It was a dead animal. In the freezer were the remains of a deer. Part of its lower half was missing, and its innards were carved out. The blood and guts I'd seen. What about the arm I'd witnessed last night, though? It must have been. But then I saw the legs of the deer. What I'd seen had been a long, thin body part. Only the dark of night and my wild imagination had transformed it into the arm of some person. Dear God, what have I done? Had this old guy really done nothing more than to create some sort of complicated organic fertilizer? Right at that moment, my instincts activated and I turned to run. I had already made it to the door of the shack when my mind started to work again. What the hell was I doing? Should I call the police? What would I tell them? That I broke into his place because I thought he was a serial killer. That he attacked me and I killed him in self-defense. Would they even believe me dressed in all black? No, it was much more likely that they thought I'd broken into his shack. Guy's thoughts 
plans, and perhaps the darkest secrets. My curiosity got the best of me, and I began flipping through the pages, discovering entries detailing his peculiar experiments and twisted philosophies. It sent shivers down my spine, and I felt a renewed sense of urgency to cover up what had transpired. I took a deep breath, focusing on the immediate task at hand. Closing the notebook, I placed it back exactly where I found it. The last thing I needed was to be implicated in whatever madness this old man had been involved in. Returning to the cornfield, I retrieved the bag of fertilizer, making my way back to the shack. I carefully disposed of the bag inside, making it blend with the other farming supplies. As I worked, a chilling thought crossed my mind. What if someone found out? What if they discovered the hidden notebook? I decided to burn it. The flames danced and crackled as I watched the notebook turn to ashes. The darkness around me seemed to intensify, and the weight of my actions pressed heavily on my conscience. What had I stumbled upon in that remote shack? The next step was to deal with the old man's body. I couldn't just leave it there, and I certainly couldn't risk burying it on his property. The cornfield seemed like the perfect solution. The soil was soft, and with the cover of night, I began digging a shallow grave. Sweat dripped down my face as I worked quickly, glancing over my shoulder every so often, paranoid about any prying eyes. Once the makeshift grave was ready, I dragged the old man's body, struggling under its weight. With a heave, I managed to lower him into the hole, covering him with dirt. I took a moment to catch my breath, realizing the enormity of what I had just done. Returning to the shack, I meticulously cleaned every inch of the crime scene once more. The chemicals, the blood, the evidence, all erased, or so I hoped. The freezing box and composter were sealed, leaving no trace of the macabre scene that had unfolded. Exhausted and emotionally drained, I stumbled out of the shack, locking the door behind me. The night air felt heavy with secrecy, and my heart raced as I retraced my steps to ensure nothing was amiss. The cornfield stood silent, concealing the dark secret buried within its depths. As I made my way back home, a gnawing fear lingered in the pit of my stomach. What had I become? The line between self-defense and cold-blooded murder had blurred, and the shadows of that night clung to me like a haunting specter. Yet, the mystery of the old man's sinister experiments and the unsettling revelations in his notebook remained, casting a long, ominous shadow over the tangled web I had unwittingly entered. Myself, again and again, that I had acted in self-defense, that the old man was a threat, but the guilt gnawed at me, a constant reminder of the darkness I now harbored. With the notebook as my guide, I delved into the gruesome task of creating the special fertilizer. Mixing the ingredients, I followed the meticulous instructions, my hands trembling with a mixture of revulsion and determination. It was an eerie dance in the dimly lit basement, the air heavy with the stench of death. As the days passed, I transformed my greenhouse into a testing ground for the twisted formula. The plants responded with unnatural vigor, growing rapidly and bearing fruits unlike anything I had seen before. The success of the fertilizer was undeniable, and a chilling realization dawned on me. I had unwittingly stumbled upon something powerful, something that transcended the boundaries of conventional agriculture. The guilt lingered, but the allure of the extraordinary harvest became a tempting distraction. 
The greenhouse turned into a sanctuary, a place where the macabre and the miraculous coexisted. Each day, I found solace in the growing greenery, a stark contrast to the shadows that haunted my conscience. However, the substitute for deer meat in my basement demanded attention. The gruesome reality of disposing of the remains weighed on me. It was a task that required detachment, a cold resolve that I had never thought I possessed. With each step into the basement, the nauseating odor assaulted my senses, a constant reminder of the gruesome act I had committed. In the dead of night, I ventured into the woods, finding a secluded spot to bury the remains. The soil seemed to welcome the darkness I brought with me, swallowing the secrets of the old man's demise. As I covered the makeshift grave, a strange calm settled over me, a chilling acceptance of the choices I had made. Days turned into weeks, and the greenhouse thrived with unnatural vitality. The whispers of guilt were drowned out by the growing chorus of thriving plants. The town, unaware of the dark alchemy at play, marveled at my newfound agricultural success. Yet, the notebook continued to haunt me. The old man's secrets, now my burden, seemed to whisper in the shadows. The eerie dance between life and death, growth and decay, played out in the greenhouse. A silent testimony to the pact I had unwillingly entered. As the seasons changed, and the once vibrant colors of the greenhouse faded into a murky twilight, I found myself standing at the crossroads of a choice. The success of my crops came at a price, and the line between gardener and accomplice blurred. The notebook, a macabre guide to prosperity, held the key to my future. A future entwined with the darkness I had tried so desperately to escape. In the missing person files, the weeks passed and the town moved on, oblivious to the dark secrets concealed within the shadows of my actions. The greenhouse continued to thrive, the crops flourishing with an uncanny vitality. The town praised my newfound agricultural prowess, and I played the role of the successful gardener concealing the gruesome truth that fueled my success. The notebook, now hidden away, served as a constant reminder of the pact I had made with the macabre. Life went on, and the guilt that had once clawed at my conscience gradually dulled. I convinced myself that old man Vernair had been a threat, that I had acted in self-defense and that the dark alchemy in my greenhouse was a means of redemption. However, the disinterested police officer returned one day, accompanied by a faint sense of suspicion. He asked more probing questions, delving into the details of the night old man Vernair supposedly vanished. I maintained my composure, weaving a web of lies to shield myself from the prying eyes of law enforcement. As the officer left, his disinterest remained, but a seed of doubt had been planted. The small village buzzed with rumors, whispers of the mysterious disappearance that lingered like a ghost. The townsfolk exchanged glances, and I felt the weight of their gaze, a silent judgment that hung in the air. Days turned into months, and the greenhouse's unnatural bounty continued to flourish. The town's fascination with my gardening skills grew, and I became a local celebrity, a facade that masked the darkness within. The missing person case of old man Werner faded into obscurity, overshadowed by the vibrant colors of my extraordinary harvest. Yet the shadows of the past refused to dissipate entirely. The greenhouse, once a sanctuary, now felt like a gilded cage, trapping me in a delicate dance with the secrets I had buried. The success I had achieved 
came at the cost of my peace of mind, and the guilt, though subdued, lingered like a persistent specter. In the quiet moments of the night, as I tended to the thriving crops, I couldn't escape the haunting memories of that fateful night. The notebook, locked away but never forgotten, whispered promises of prosperity and pitfalls of damnation. As seasons changed, and the greenhouse stood as a testament to my unholy alliance with the unnatural, I found myself at the mercy of the choices I had made. The town celebrated my success. Unaware of the darkness that loomed beneath the surface, a darkness that threatened to consume the fragile balance I had meticulously crafted. The town's interest in old man Vernier's property waned as the seasons changed, and the unsettling rumors about his disappearance lingered. His house, now for sale, stood as a silent testament to the mysteries that had unfolded within its walls. However, no one showed any interest in the property, as if an invisible barrier kept potential buyers at bay. Late in the year, as winter approached, my greenhouse became a haven for thriving crops. The fertilizer I had meticulously created had matured, transforming the once ordinary plants into vibrant, robust specimens. The tomatoes, in particular, had flourished, exhibiting a richness of flavor and size that surpassed any expectations. It was a bittersweet triumph, a harvest tainted by the shadows of the past. Six months prior, I had upgraded the greenhouse for winter farming, creating an environment conducive to the growth of my extraordinary crops. The success of the fertilizer was undeniable, and as I tended to the flourishing plants, a sense of satisfaction mingled with the ever-present guilt. Observing the greenery, I couldn't help but notice the exceptional health of the plants. They surpassed even old man Vernier's, thriving under the unique conditions of the greenhouse. A subtle suspicion crept into my mind. Was it the greenhouse itself? Or had my own addition to the fertilizer played a role in this unnatural abundance? As I typed out these thoughts, a grim irony dawned upon me, and laughter bubbled up from within. The very essence of the old man, once a threat, and now a vital component of the fertilizer, had inadvertently contributed to the success of my crops. In a twisted turn of fate, his quest for the perfect formula had led him to become a part of it. The greenhouse, now a realm of paradoxical prosperity, harbored the secrets of a macabre alliance between life and death. The town remained oblivious to the dark alchemy at play, and I continued to wear the facade of the successful gardener, concealing the unsettling truth that lurked beneath the surface. As winter settled in, I found myself caught between the satisfaction of my thriving crops and the haunting echoes of the past. The greenhouse, once a sanctuary, now stood as a chilling reminder of the choices made and the unholy pact forged in the pursuit of agricultural excellence. In the quiet solitude of my greenhouse, surrounded by the vibrant foliage that conceals a tale of dark alchemy and unintended consequences, I reflect on the journey that brought me to this unsettling equilibrium. The once whispered rumors of old man Vernier's disappearance have faded into the background, overshadowed by the facade of a successful gardener. The property, once belonging to the enigmatic old man, lingers in the periphery of the town's awareness, its fate hanging in a delicate balance the house, with its secrets hidden within, remains untouched, a silent witness to the peculiarities that unfolded within its walls. 
as winter blankets the landscape, my greenhouse continues to defy the natural order. A testament to the success born from a sinister blend of life and death. The tomatoes, ripe and bursting with flavor, are a symbol of the grim irony that permeates this horticultural sanctuary. In this closing chapter, I find myself caught between the satisfaction of my thriving crops and the haunting echoes of a past, stained by choices made in desperation. The town remains blissfully unaware, the shadows of my deeds concealed beneath the superficial allure of agricultural prowess. As the seasons turn and the greenhouse stands as a living paradox, I am left to ponder the consequences of a pact forged with nature's darker forces. The grim irony persists, a silent reminder that sometimes prosperity arises from the most unexpected and unsettling alliances. In the stillness of this horticultural haven, I grapple with the duality of my existence. A successful gardener on the surface yet forever bound to the shadows that dance between the rows of flourishing crops. The old man's pursuit of the perfect formula, though twisted and macabre, inadvertently became the key to a harvest that defied nature itself. And so, the greenhouse stands as a quiet mausoleum of secrets, a living testament to the blurred lines between right and wrong, life and death. As I close the door to this chapter of my life, I am left to wonder how long the facade will hold, how long the town will remain oblivious to the grim irony that thrives within the heart of my thriving garden.